Hello and welcome to Eavesdropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we are doing another unfilmed Jean-Pierre Melville. Um, we said in the last podcast that we were going to take a break and do something American for my sake because I was getting a bit overwhelmed with the existentialism. But um, because these are shortly going to be leaving movie, we thought we'd get on these. So Army of Shadows is what we've just watched. It's from 1969 and I think you were saying this is the one that you really wanted me to watch. Yes. Why is that? Because it's about the resistance. And also, uh, it has an English kind of dimension to it. It kind of has a classical Hollywood element to it. Yeah, it's kind of referring back to Gone with the Wind. Uh, And also, I think it's my favorite of his. I think it's a great masterpiece of the cinema. It's to, you know, kind of... If you look at the policier genre, it would have to be Le Samurai for me. Uh, but I think this is kind of like an ex- a truly extraordinary film. Like one of the greats of all time. I really, really liked it. I thought it moved really swiftly and beautifully. I think we've spoken before about s- smoothness of narration of films. This has that. Yes. You know, it, it, kind of, it has a fairly wide cast of characters within the resistance. And they get split up. But it kind of it moves between their various story strands really nicely. It's a very well told story, and it's it's poetically told. There are moments, you know, there are subtle moments of just great beauty. Actually, you know, kind of. I mean, there's a moment that caught my eye this time, you know, where uh, the young man at the beginning of the film is being picked up uh, because he's betrayed the resistance. And, you know, he's basically being taken to be killed and he knows, he knows it. Yeah, he's been caught out and he knows what his fate is going to be. And he's, you know, he goes out of his room and they go by the sea. And, you know, somehow the film conveys that he's looking at the sea as a last moment in life. Yeah, that kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, and I thought that was just kind of so beautiful. You almost wonder how is, you know, how is the film conveying this? But it does. The film has these moments of just kind of great subtlety and and beauty. Yeah. Uh, So the film stars Lino Ventura, who I must have seen before because I've seen um, Lift to the Scaffold. But I don't remember Lift to the Scaffold all that well, so I don't remember him. I think he's really captivating in this. He's fantastic. Uh, He's one of the great stars, you know, one of the sacred monsters, as they call them, of French cinema, you know. So the film has an all-star cast of Paul Maurice, yeah, who is uh, Saint-Luc, the head of all of the resistance. It's got Simone Signoret, who is probably my, you know, my uh, favorite actress of all time anywhere. Uh, again, you know, she's like a real figure in French cinema. She was half Jewish. Her real name is Simone Kaminsky. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, she... She was herself involved in minor ways uh, in the resistance um, in in the early 1940s. She really could only have a film career after the war was over, yeah, because of her name, yeah, so she had kind of bit parts everywhere. Uh, And then, of course, she became one of the great stars of French cinema, again, starring in many noirs in the late 40s, uh, Dede d'Anvers and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, she won the Oscar for Room at the Top, uh, a British film. And um, she was married to Yves Montand. Yeah? And together, they were really kind of a symbol of the left in France. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, again, her appearance here you know, carries a whole series of connotations if you know about them. Yeah. Yves Montand was in uh, Zed, right? That um, yes, was it was it French Zed, but based on Greek politics. Yeah, yeah, it's a Costa Gavras film. Yeah, because the ending of this rather reminded me of Zed, and this will be, I suppose, a spoiler for the end of both films. But they are from the like nineteen sixties, so come on. It's a very dour ending in this, with really no sense of victory of any description. Um, although you know in this that the war is ultimately going to end and things will kind of improve in France, um, everyone in this really ends up dying. Um, yes. So that, so you have the four 
remaining male members of the resistance uh, tracking Matilde down, fearing that she's been forced to uh, give up their identities. So they kill her in the street, and then you get this text on screen, which is really what reminded me of Zed, which says, okay, so this guy took a cyanide pill, this guy was tortured by the Nazis, and it says about um, Lino Ventura's character, Gerbier, who is the kind of the main character, I suppose, of the ensemble. Um, this time he chose not to run. The running, I think, refers to this sadistic torture that he undergoes in captivity by the Nazis, where a Nazi officer sets up a firing squad with a machine gun at one end of a giant hall and says, if you can reach the end, you'll live till tomorrow. And he just, he, he doesn't run, and then he does. And the thing says, this time he chose not to run at all. So basically everybody dies, and it's very, very dour. And there's a similar dour ending in, in Zed, although I'm not going to kind of rehash it, but it reminded me of it, a kind of, basically a, a sub kind of, a sub uh, jugation or sub, I can't think what the word is, to the kind of evil powers. There's no victory here, yes. right? Um, well, the victory, the victory is in the resistance itself. Yeah, you know. Um, and actually, I don't know if it's just me going through a mood or, you know. But I, I kind of, I keep reading everything in the light of this pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the film is so marvelous, basically, because. It's all about moral courage, right? It's all about taking responsibility for actions and having the courage to follow on your beliefs, right? The film is all about that, you know? And it's also about the stresses between solidarity and duty, you know, and the good of all versus kind of, mm. you know, one's own individual feelings and actions. It's all about... It's all about the cause and the collectivity, right? So, you know, at the very beginning of the film, what happens is the Lino Ventura character, Gerbier, is arrested. Yeah, he's taken to a camp. You know, there's a plan for escape and some, and he gets betrayed. Yeah, now, I didn't quite understand if he was betrayed by the young man, by the communist, or if one of the other cellmates squealed on them. Yeah, that's kind of, I think, left a bit up in the air, except the young communist is no longer in that cell. Yeah, he's taken to Gestapo headquarters and, you know, has the courage to make a run for it. Yeah, and he's lucky enough to escape. And then also you get these nice little touches about how people who are not themselves or who might not have the personality or the, or the personal courage to themselves take an action, nonetheless are willing to help, yeah, kind of put themselves out in different ways, yeah, contribute. That's the role of the barber that Serge Reggiani, also a big star, mm. right, who we saw in Le Doulos just the other day. Uh, that's what he does, yeah. He kind of, it's very quiet. I think it's a beautifully done scene. It's very quiet, not much is said, yeah, but he gives him yeah. a new coat, yeah. The opening in the uh, sort of prison camp made me think of uh, Baccarat, where you spoke about the 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 frame being peopled in Baccarat. You get yes. a sense of this entire uh, little community. Because if you compare that to what you've said recently about Le Doulos and and Flick, yeah. the Melville, you said, well, it's notable there that the frame really is absent of people a lot of the time and it really isolates people. Then those two films had a real existentialist streak running through them um mm. and so th there's this, there's one shot in particular which i'm sure you must it, it, it's quite a notable shot in this of uh, gerbier walking through the camp and it's a kind of long shot that i think very gradually kind of zooms out and it pans from left to right and back to left again and the camp is full of people left and right and he's kind of walking through the middle of them and it's not like it, they're not like paying attention to him it's just that's the way it's composed and his voiceover talks about Jews of all nationalities anti-Franco Spaniards anti-Nazi Germans anti-fascist Italians so you get this sense of in that both through the composition and the kind of filling the frame with people and the voiceover this sense of nationality and and who you are kind of what you were born being whatever being completely material because everyone is put together in this and it's about your belief and your identity everyone on their base is a political prisoner of some sort and that's yes. what links them 
and that's what gives them a kind of sense of solidarity. But I think what's interesting, and I should say, I spoke to Celia, I just mentioned to her, Celia, a friend of the podcast who's been on it once before, I mentioned to her that we were watching this, and she said, oh, it's really good. And she said, one of the good things about it, let me just find, because I, I sent her a message, she sent me one back. Let me just quickly find what she said, because I thought it was interesting. She said, here we are. The way it's like, here's people in a terrible situation, she says, and they can only rat each other out to the Nazis. So it's pretty progressive for the time. This is the late 60s, when everyone was trying to claim they were in the resistance and all the resistance were great heroes. And she said yes. it's it's a film that gives a more nuanced view of that. This is actually not everything yeah. we were able to do in the resistance was a great heroic thing. Because actually what you see, yes. I think, a lot of the time in this film speaks to kind of self-preservation and um, fear and a kind of suspicion of everyone who's in the resistance. Again, uh, another film that I was kind of comparing it to while I was watching it was The Great Escape, which maybe sounds silly. But the thing about The Great Escape is there's a real kind of nobility in the tying up Jerry's resources and trying to be a thorn in his side while the war's going on. Yes. You know? And that's definitely what the resistance is doing trying to tie up German resources and make them spend time, waste time, chasing them around. But um, they're always kind of on the back foot, the resistance. Like They're always trying to get someone, one of their members, out of captivity, out of prison, trying to escape. There's no sense of yes. trying to build up. There's no sense of like, okay, we've got some time now. We can put together a big romantic plan. There's nothing really romantic about the way they behave in this. Everything is on the back foot. Yes, I mean... The, you know, and I think in a way that speaks to the contrast of the two films. I mean, this is a vastly superior film, you know, and partly because, you know, it doesn't show that easy heroism. It actually yeah. kind of, you know, complicates things. It shows people being, you know, uh, 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 complex. So I think, you know, the Mathilde character is wonderful. She's somebody who's very courageous, very organized, you know, kind of a, a real heroine, right? You know, but in the end, she's got to be killed, right? And she does it out of, you know, a complete human frailty. She's got a picture of her daughter in her wallet that she's been advised to remove, but she somehow couldn't bring herself to. And actually, that is her Achilles heel. Mm. So, um, yeah, these kind of, this focuses on ordinary people doing extraordinary things and actually all coming together from different walks, very different walks of life, all having to uh, live separately. So actually, there's a continuity, I think, in Melville's work, you know, because you also get that sense of existentialism, you know, of taking responsibility for your life, of being essentially lonely and alone. But in this film, you know, the cells dictate that, because actually, if you know too much, yeah, then if you're caught, you can reveal too much. Mm. So the thing is actually, you know, on a need-to-know basis and to kind of keep apart from people as much as possible which kind of, you know, reinforces some of Melville's themes. And nonetheless, you get a sense of, you know, individual action correlating to kind of collective responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So do you think Celia has a point where she talks about the film kind of showing a more honest and sort of unvarnished view of the resistance than people in the 60s, the, the French in the 60s, were trying to paint of themselves? Yes. Or do you think she's been contrary? No, no, I think she's right. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of the resistance movies are like the great escape. Yeah, they're all rah, rah, we were heroes, right? Yeah. You know, whereas in fact, actually, you see here how, you know, a lot of the people were taking great risks. Yes, but sometimes they ratted it out on others. Sometimes they didn't have the courage to, to act, you know, kind of. Uh, sometimes they didn't act on principle, uh, sometimes they um, judged other people. I mean, I think the relationship between the two brothers mm. here is so lovely, right? Because they're both working for the resistance. Neither one knows that the other is, or certainly the younger brother doesn't know about the older brother, right? And yet, uh, until that moment where he takes him on the boat, right? And then kind of, you know, he says, this is where the base meets the head of the pyramid, right? And actually, they're brothers, right? So that's very resonant about kind of the the resistance as a whole. Um, so, yeah, I kind of... Um... Could I just point out, though, that um, although I quite agree with what you're saying about The Great Escape, everyone British in that died. 
apart from one guy who had to be saved by an American. So, you know, it's not wasn't so great for the British in that. The Americans had a good time. Yeah, but the thing about, you know, I, and, I, and I mean, this might be, you know, a time to make distinctions. I mean, I saw The Great Escape, in fact, just the other day because it's playing on Netflix. All oh, right. You know, and it's great fun. Right. And the film has been great fun for, you know, 40 or 50 years. It's a classic of its kind. Yeah. But it is only fun. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this film has great depth and nuance and it's so moving. I mean, actually, there were moments where I, um, I had tears in my eyes, actually, you know, uh, like so many. Yeah. The moment where the brothers meet in the boat. And that's a, such a beautiful shot, you know, with with the submarine. The moment where um, the same character, the, the Jean-Pierre Cassel character, who nobody knows why he's left the resistance, ha actually has gotten himself arrested to uh, warn the person they're trying to rescue. And in fact, it's all too late. And the German officer tells him, if you don't tell us your real name, you know, nobody will know you're dead, right? So actually he's sacrificing himself with the knowledge that nobody will know what he's done. I mean, it's truly altruistic. Yeah, nobody will know that, you know, he's done this great thing, uh, you know, because the great thing would not be possible to do if he told anyone. So kind of there are moments like that, I, I think, really kind of moved me. And also, I think like all great films, it makes you think about yourself, right? Like kind of, you know, you think, well, I mean, here we are in a pandemic. I'm living it quite luxuriously, you know, and I'm whinging and moaning and blah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't think and I can't concentrate and this and that, you know. And here are people in much kind of worse circumstances actually acting for others, you know. Yeah. So I kind of... Um, yeah. One of the things that I, I think I like most about the film was that, and certainly in comparison to the other two Mel films that we've already watched, is that it really doesn't feel like a genre film. Which is not to say a word oh, yeah. against genre films, because I like those, and I like, you know, particularly noirs, which we've watched, you know, I particularly like the way that they always end up with everybody dying or having no escape and so on and so forth. But um, what I like in this is that there's really no predicting really what's going to happen next. And it's not in a sense of... Yes. of deliberately keeping you on your toes but it's just it feels incredibly organic and really true to life that life is complex right and you can't really predict what's going to happen next so so maybe someone will turn out to be the head of the resistance maybe someone will get captured and plans have to change everything is kind of subject to change and in play in this every yes. every plot point you know so even though ultimately it does end with this thing that kind of it feels like quite a neat ending in a sense in a, in a plot sense that mm. everybody dies and you get this summation of of how everybody dies. Um, still, kind of how we got there feels extremely true to life. And I think actually that's a real achievement. I haven't really, I haven't really occurred to me until just now. But I think that's a really, really good thing about the film. It's a great film. I love everything about it. I love the way that things are framed. Again, you can see this thing in Melville where, you know, he's using a wide frame, yeah, but kind of uh, the frame is broken up kind of into sections. Uh, I love the way that he uses the zoom. Hmm. Yeah, this is a film very much of its time, and he's constantly using the zoom, you know, but as a way of drawing your attention often through crowds. Um, it looks really beautiful, yeah, kind of. Yes, it uh, does. You know, uh, the film is mostly dull, foggy, grey, green, yeah, until the moments in London where they go see Gone with the Wind, and then you have, like, these brightly coloured kind of you know, reds. Um, there's a wonderful moment where, uh, in, again in London, where he's in a nightclub and everybody's dancing and a bomb goes off and, you know, dust begins to come from the ceiling and nobody stops dancing, right? You know, which, I th again, I think is kind of, you know, it's so lovely. And, you know, in relation to the name of the film, you know, it's an army of shadows because everything is underground, everything is on the... Sh you know, everything is like a shadow. Nobody can be seen. You know, everyone is kind of doing their bits, like, you know, where they can't be seen. You know, but on the other hand, there is an army of them, right? Kind of, you know, uh, but it's like a cadre, right? Like, so, you know, there's small groups of people that know each other and kind of, you know, that, that don't know about anybody else, which is why, you know, two sets of brothers or a set of brothers doesn't know that the other one is equally involved in um, the resistance. Um, you also get a sense, you know, for 
for the way of life, for the coming together of people. So on the one hand, you have the young communists. On the other hand, you know, you have the aristocrat who's really a royalist, yeah, but who makes his estate yeah, available to the resistance. And of course, he gets shot as well. Uh, so I think kind of, you know, this thing about both um, the conditions in which people lived in, the actions that they made, the risk involved in every action, and then the human frailty in undertaking it, you know, i.e., you know, the kind of people are human. They're not all going to act the same way. They're not all heroes, right? I thought, you know, you get a kind of a panoramic view of, you know, kind of uh, different people coming together, right? And some are legionnaires, you know, but some are just like housewives or, yeah, like kind of, or a barber or, yeah, kind of people um, who kind of, who take a moral stance in very difficult uh, circumstances when their actions could, yeah, cause them death, actually. Do you think the film does a good enough job of putting across what they're fighting against? Because yes. to me, it feels sort of taken as read that they're fighting against the Nazis and the Nazis are obviously bad. Do you see what I mean? Well, uh, yes. Uh, but remember, the film is 69. Paris was liberated in 44, hmm. right? So for, you know, anybody over 30, it would have been living memory, yeah. right? You know, so kind of not a lot of explanation is needed for that. Um, no, sure, but I suppose what I mean is that within the within the kind of setup and the world and the logic of the film, um, I think this goes back to what I was saying about it feeling like there's no great victory in any of this, and I I appreciate that that's that there's a there may be kind of kind of the point um, that all they can do is resist. I mean that's in the name, right? But is the film? Do you think? Do you feel the film is ultimately saying? It can't possibly be saying that, like, this was failed or there was no point to this or anything or, or that kind of thing. But um, I'm trying to think how to phrase it because because obviously Melville was in the resistance himself, right? So he's drawing on his own experiences. Uh, to me, I think there's no question about it. There's no question that what they're doing is good and necessary and important. I yeah. mean, that uh, it never even occurred to me you know, to think otherwise. No, no, it's not, it's certainly not to say that what they're doing is bad, <laughs> obviously, but um, that it might be futile, you know, like they, they don't cause any defeat against the Nazis, anything like that, you know. Well, I think what you're, you're right in that the accent is on, um, so you, you never see them do any action, right? Yeah, so, you know, it's, they never blow up, like, Gestapo headquarters or anything, right? It's all about moving along, getting by, yeah, uh, trying to keep the organization together. Mm. Uh, you know, it's the accent is on the organization itself rather than what they do, yeah? But actually, everything that you see is a result of the great peril that people have put themselves in. Right. So, I mean, it begins with an arrest and, you know, and then you have escape. Right. And then you have be being on the run, you know, and then you have like, you know, the execution of a person. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so kind of it's all the focus is all on that. Right. But actually, for me, it really highlights the the courage that people had and actually, you know, the difficult decisions that they were forced to take. Um you know, you you get nothing about personal pleasure, right? There's no there's no girlfriends, there's no banquets, there's not even like a scene where they have a drink after you know surviving something, right? Yeah, it it is. Uh, you know, the accent is all about kind of you know making sure that the resistance keeps going, and actually, the fact is that almost everybody that you see dies. Yeah. So it takes on an incredible toll on these people, yeah, who are ordinary people. And I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, uh, what's important, really. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen Le Doulos, we've seen Un Flick, we've seen this. And actually, you can really see continuities amongst the films. Yeah. You know, kind of all these gangsters 
who have a code of honor, right, who value kind of friendship and loyalty, right, who are all alone, yeah, in a very seedy, cruel uh, world. I mean, you can actually see all of those elements in this film as well, yeah? Yeah, uh, I suppose. I mean, it's interesting that on, uh, on movie, the strand that this is part of is called The Crimes of Jean-Pierre Melville. And, you know, you'd really yeah. not call this a crime movie in any sense. Um, Except it has, it does have continuity. So, I mean, for example, for the Gestapo or for the German occupation army, these are all gangsters. And actually, I think they're referred to as terrorists in the film. Yeah, I think but, they are, yeah. So, so, you know, and they are committing crimes on a daily basis, right? Except that the gain, instead of being diamonds, you know, or like millions in bills, is actually to kind of do damage to the to the occupation. So, yeah, so I think there are actually kind of parallels or continuities or strands that kind of, you know, you can um, develop in all of this. Hmm. I think that might be a little bit of a reach. Um. Well, um, I, 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 I don't think so. I mean, you know, kind of by if you're looking at you know, who the authorities were, yeah, during the occupation, it was the Germans. Yeah, and what is the resistance doing? The The resistance is committing crime after crime after crime after crime, right? That's, that's Yeah, I mean, that's a kind of technically true way of putting it, but I think the, the, the emphasis is not on them as crimes, you know, in the same way that, like, in, in, in uh, and Flick or whatever, a robbery is, the focus is, is it's a robbery or a heist. Like, that's not how it it's framed here at all, really. Um... um well, yes and no. I mean, you know, because, uh, you know, the other films, like Le, Le Dulos is so much more about the people than the heist, yeah? You know, and, yeah, so it is like, and your your uh, sympathies are with the criminals, right? Um, so actually, I think there are a lot of, you know, continuities. And the sense of isolation, of existential loneliness, of you know, kind of being responsible to yourself and to an idea, you know, but fundamentally kind of being alone in the world. I mean, I thought, for example, you know, it's very interesting that the only relationships that you, uh, that are conveyed in uh, L'Armée des Ombres is the two brothers. Yeah. yeah? Who, who, and actually what they tell you is, I don't, you know, I love him, but we've lost touch. We have nothing in common. Blah, yeah. So actually... You know, you're you're told how they're disconnected until the moment where they realize they're working to a common goal, and then the other is the one where you you hear very little of the husband. She, you know, Mathilde clearly has a whole life. What we see her do is what she does in the shadows, but she's got this whole other life. She's got a husband and she's got a daughter, and yeah. you know, kind of all of those things, you know, and the connection to the daughter is here seen as her Achilles heel. That's, yeah, you know. her one mistake, as one of the characters puts it. Exactly. The one mistake right. she ever made was keeping a photo of her daughter yeah. that could identify her, that could be then used as uh, a hostage-type yeah. situation. Yeah. Which is not that different than Alain Delon you know, his one mistake, falling for the wrong woman. <laughs> yeah, <that's great>. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, because also he's unable to control that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, anyway. I mean, this has a much more oppressive tone, though. I think this has the sense of, uh, like, the, the gangsters, the, 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 the gangster films, um, you know, they have a sense of these, these are lives that people chose and there's there's no... There's no way of looking at that here. Like so when I talked earlier about the Nazi occupation being not really maybe like fleshed out enough, um, I still think there's there's a sense of a point there. But um, what is definitely the case is that you understand completely the, the the way the resistance behaves and what they have to do and the way they have to live is entirely because they live under this thumb, and actually they have no choice but to resist. Otherwise, it would just be giving up, and that's why you end up in this situation where you feel like there's no ultimate sort of victory everyone everyone ultimately has to just resist until they have no choice but to die and in the last minute of the film five people 
die like that. Everyone just is extinguished right at the end. And the death of the young men at the start is uh, really brutal because there's this thing about how the, the house that they are in next door is occupied and so they can't use a gun and they end up strangling him. And it's it's very, very, very unpleasant and like not a good death, you know? I thought that whole sequence was very beautiful because uh, Mel- Melville does something very complex, really, which is... You know, they're killing a comrade, yeah? And it's a very young man. It's a, it's a young man who you have a sense probably made some stupid mistake or got mm. caught in a stupid way. But he knows what's coming. He knows he's done something wrong and he knows that he's got to pay for it, right? Uh, but the thing about the scene is, first of all, nobody wants to do it. Yeah, everything goes wrong. It's supposed to be quiet. They're supposed to shoot him. You know, now neighbors have moved in. They can't shoot him. They've got to find another way of killing him, Right. It's both very practical, but also fraught with tension. So nobody wants to do it in that way. Um, They certainly don't want to make him suffer. Yet, you know, the situation dictates that he must be killed. And he knows that, right? Uh, But Melville lets you focus on his face. Yeah, on this young face, you know, with beautiful blue eyes. And he shows you his tears, right? Yeah, at the very moment that they, they kill him. So, so there's something I think very beautiful and complex in the way that that is staged for us because you get the sense of duty that it must be done, the unwillingness of you know people to actually kind of do it, that they've got to be ordered to do it, you know, the practical element of finding a way of doing it that's quiet and so on. There's no resistance from the young man, he knows it's coming, mm. right? You know, and so you feel for him. And yet you also understand why what's being done is being done, right? So it's almost yeah. like kind of, you know, your, 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 your feelings are spread out amongst the group. It's, it's something that's very complex, yeah, because, you know, it allows you to feel for the character, but also to understand, you know, why the other people are doing it, yeah? So it's none of this hurrah heroism that you might get in some other films. It's almost kind of filled with sadness, actually. Yeah, I mean, and to me, the central the, the central feeling I had in that scene was was about the brutality of it. Though. That was the main thing that came across to me. But it's not brutality in the way that the Nazis, you know, it's like it's it's not they're not doing this for sport or fun. Yeah, you know, when that when the Nazi tortures uh, the main character and, and and people with him run up here, and if you can get to the end, you'll survive. You know, it's not that at all. And and there is a feeling I think in in that scene with the the murder of the boy there is a feeling of inhumanity to it you know you do understand why they have to do it and that it threatens the organization and so on and i think it's partly through the brutality that it feels inhumane but partly because he is such a young boy as well that it it is the point is it's something that they have to do not something that they want to do as you say and so it is different to what the nazis are doing but still it's very very unpleasant but it is rendered very complex you know i think that's what the film actually does but it renders everything really complex I think it's a really admirably complex film and portrayal of people in an awful situation and the things that they have to do and the kind of suspicions that they have to have over the people. I mean, that's that, when you were talking about, oh, I'm relating everything to the pandemic these days, that's how it related to me. Interestingly, that thing about what I think I said during the Contagion podcast about um, being uh, kind of in it with everybody everyone is in this together and at the same time suspicious of everybody and there's a sense of that amongst the resistance folks in this and that's another reason that again relationships relationships are dangerous yes i mean so i think when you think about commonalities between this and the other two uh films that we've seen le doulos and and flick that probably is a commonality i think you would certainly (laughs) say that you know that i mean i think for me the commonality between these three films it's not so much in the style, because I think they occupy really different styles, but it is about how the characters relate to each other. And you know what we've been pointing out or picking up on in the previous films about um, isolation and alienation, that I think actually, that's how it comes through in here. Yes. You know, you're, you're working with these people and you survive by working with them. Yes. But you still have to have, to have this distance. Because yeah, um... it's dangerous. But also the courage to act, 
Yeah. So actually, another commonality with the gangsters and so on. I mean, they might be doing it for money, right? But they've got to have the courage to act. Yeah. To kind of, you know, run or shoot or yeah, take their life in their hands. Yeah, to do an action, and you see that in this film over and over again as well. Yeah. So um, it's, I think, one of the great masterpieces of the cinema. I think Jean-Pierre Melville is one of the great directors in the history of cinema. Uh, it's widely available, so uh, you know, I highly recommend it. And we will be also looking at The Red Circle, Le, Le Sacre Rouge, uh, which is the last of the films uh, of Melville's that are currently available uh, on movie as our next uh, podcast. Yes, you're very worried about me going, oh, well, I'm just going to pack it all in. I don't want to see another male film, but I'm very happy to see all the rest of them. You know, it's just, it's just because I had a bit of a funny turn with Ledoux Lost where I just wasn't really into it and thought, uh, oh, this is too much existentialism for one week. Yeah. But this, you know, this is a really properly good film. I think it's just, it's complex and it moves so smoothly and it looks so beautiful. It's shot so well and n nothing is rendered simple in it other than, I suppose, the fact that um, the Nazis are bad and you should fight them, which I think is... I mean, it's obvious, but it is a bit simple in this. Yeah. But that's not really the focus. <laughs> <laughs> this is a truly great film. So do see it if you can. Uh, so yeah. thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies and we are on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Vive la resistance. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>